Good morning, Kingdom Faith Church. It is such a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, we in the building here with the team, we are really excited. I don't know about you, but we've been praying and we are really looking forward to everything that God is going to do today. Just while praying, I had this uh, sentence coming through, um, heaven breaking through heaven breaking through. That is what we want to see this morning. Who's ready for some of that? I'm so looking forward to today. So maybe if you're lying down, it's time to, to get up, do a few jumps, shake it all off, wake yourself up. Maybe we want to slap your face a bit um, or, or you want to let us shout out. I'm not going to shout right now because I might break your TV speakers. I don't know. Um, but we want to make a decision. We are not going to miss out on anything that God has for us this morning. And our children and youth have loads to be excited about today too. So let's hear it from Dave right now. Good morning, everyone. This morning, there is loads for your children and young people to be getting involved with. In fact, this morning is the first Sunday morning of the Consecrate theme, Ecclesia. It's a brand new theme. It's just started this week. You'll have already started the Bible reading plan on Monday, hopefully. Go to the Version Bible app and type in Ecclesia and just search. you'll find Consecrate one there. And it's a Bible reading plan that you can follow along every day, even if you're an adult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that is your first Sunday morning on the Zoom call this morning on that brand new topic. Join Fraser and the team at half past ten, please. Uh, so that's your first week. Speaking of firsts, we're now going to go to our last week for J247. It is our last Sunday morning uh, of the Easter holiday. So it is our last Sunday morning uh, looking at the topic of Easter for J247. Uh, go to kf.church forward slash online and then just click on the parents tab and you'll find all the craft and download and videos that you need there. Next week for J247, you're kicking off a brand new adventure. Six brand new animals and six brand new characteristics that will teach us some truths from the Bible. So God's Animal Kingdom starts next week with J247. We hope that you can join us. Have a wonderful week. Uh, may God's grace and his peace be with you today and every day this week. Has that been there the whole time? How funny, how embarrassing. Come on, you Spurs. Have a wonderful week. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, Dave. Let's just take a minute to pray for our young people this morning. Father, we thank you for simply a fresh encounter this morning for every kid, every youth that's going to connect in. Father, for a revelation that you are their saviour, their maker and that you want that relationship with them, Father. We thank you that they would be blessed, and we thank you for the team that's involved in making all of this happen. Father, we thank you for a great morning for each of them. Amen. Now, how cool is it that our youth group has their own Bible plan on the Bible app. Man, I wish when I was younger, my youth group would have been that cool. Now, I don't know about Dave's comments about come on you Spurs, but um, I was really impressed with Chelsea's performance in the FA Cup uh, last night. So I was really happy with that. You know, it had me on the edge of my seat and jumping up at the end whistle. And you know what? That's exactly how God wants us to be this morning. On the edge of our seats, expectant to see God move, saying, come on, God, I'm ready. I want to see you move today because God wants to move in your life. And I actually have a testimony that we've got through from uh, one of the uh, passing counter nights. Um, and there were some words of knowledge shared that night and one of them was about uh, this God wanting to restore a sense of uh, smell and taste in people and one person just grabbed that word for themselves and instantly God restored their sense of taste and smell. So how good is that? God still heals today. God is on the move today and as we go into worship I want to read uh, one story in the Bible. Uh, it's found in Luke 17. 
and it says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, we're not all tens cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now obviously the story is about two things. There's the healing part, but there's also the thankfulness part of it. And as we go into worship, I want all of us to just start thanking God right now. Be like that one man that came back and, and threw, it, threw himself at the feet of Jesus, praising Him for who He was and just worshiping Him, thanking Him. And so start thanking God for who He is right now in your, home, in your own home. Just stand up. Start thanking Him for who He is. Start thanking Him for what He has done. But also, I want you to be bold. And I believe the Holy Spirit will lay something on your heart right now. But start thanking God in anticipation for something that He is going to do today. Maybe you need a breakthrough. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe a, it's the restoration of a relationship. Maybe it's provision. But start thanking God in anticipation anticipation for what he is going to do let faith rise up right now let's just start doing it together father we thank you we thank you for who you are you are the king of kings and lord of lords you are the one who reigns father i thank you that you are so good to us you are the faithful one the one who never fails you are the one who still heals today father your word says that you never leave us or forsake us father you are good lord we just praise you we exalt you with a loud voice as it said in that scripture we raise up a shout of praise father we thank you we praise you lord you are so good jesus there is none like you lord none like you lord thank you father just keep going in your own home right now just praise him and thank him with a loud voice thank you lord thank you lord From death and hell Keep my eyes on Him Who showed me a grace no end Never known a love A love that forgives like this Keep me closer still Jesus my everything all things new. He makes all things new. I live for His glory. Mm. Till we face to face, Jesus have all of me, all of me. Praise Him, oh praise Him, the Savior of my soul.
cry, God most high. Come on, Jesus. Holy, holy forever. All the earth's cry out. Your praise is loud. Holy, holy, all creation. It's all creation cries. You God. We love you, Lord. We love you. 
love you, Jesus. How can we stop singing? How can we stop praising you for all the goodness, all the kindness, all the mercy you have shown, Jesus? Father, just want to encourage you. Just lift your hands before him now. Just engage your heart with him. Your mind, your whole being with him. Like you're just partly lifting your hands as a as an action of Father, I want to just take a hold of you afresh today. Also, you're lifting your hands to say, Father, I surrender to you and I need you. You are my life. You are God most high. There is no other God like you. You are the true and the living God. And Father, as I take hold of you this morning, I thank you that you take a hold of me. He is taking hold of his church at this time, his bride. He has his purposes to outwork. And the church, his people are here for his benefit, for his glory. We know that God works in us, that God blesses us, that God does many, many things in us and we need Him to do those things. But first and foremost, we understand that God is not here firstly for us, but we are here for Him. The Bible says that if we seek first His kingdom and righteousness, everything else will be added. There's a kingdom principle that as you sow, you will reap. The world's kind of principle is a bit more the opposite. You know, if I, if I give away, if I do certain things and have less, that, you know, therefore I'm going to have less. And, Whereas God's kingdom works on investment. The Bible says that as we draw near to Him, He draws near to us. As I sow, as I give, whatever that means, time, love, forgiveness, grace, mercy, 
whatever it looks like that we're giving, God will never be outgiven. We we understand that we are here for His purposes, for His glory, for His honour, for His name. I just want to read out a word that Pastor Jonathan Dyke sent me this morning. Kind of sums up so well what God is what God is doing. He says God has been preparing His church in secret during this time and is about to reveal His church, His people, in public. A church that is clean and pure. A church of authority and influence. A church which is obedient and determined. A beautiful and dominant church. Victorious, overcoming church. A church, His people, being revealed in society. Places of influence and power and authority. And as you let my word dwell in you and my spirit overwhelm you, I will bring you in to a new, spaci- and new and spacious places. Places that I've been preparing for you. People that I've been preparing for you. There will be a release of authority and grace, power and mercy, faith and love. Multitudes will see what I have been doing and I will come and, and then they will come to the wells of salvation. Wells which will flow with clear and refreshing water for the souls of men. Drenching the nations with my glory, causing them to turn to me. God's been doing a work in every one of our, <clears throat> every one of our hearts and lives during this last year or so. And he's been preparing his bride. And he's preparing his bride because he wants intimacy with him. And in that intimacy, we know him. In that intimacy, we allow him to work in and through us. In that place of intimacy, his life then flows out from us to others. I believe God wants to do some things in us this morning, not just bring a word with a, a bit of a response at the end. I, I believe God wants to do some things in us today. Part of it is a con- ongoing fresh surrender to Him. Surrendering to Him never finishes. It's something we do every day. We're surrendering our thinking, our minds, We're surrendering circumstances. We're surrendering all kinds of things to Him during the day, every day. Why? Because we want to live with the mind of Christ. We want to respond in the way that He would. We don't want to live in fear in any way, but we want to live in faith. We don't want to live in offence in any way, but we want to live in forgiveness. We don't want to live uh, in doubt and unbelief. We want to live according to what He says and what He is doing. We don't want to live according to the circumstances around us and say they are the dominant thing. No, we want to live according to what He is saying and what that looks like as we apply it in our lives. And as we apply what He's saying in our lives, then we see the things around us change to then line up with what He is saying. And God has been doing something deep in our hearts and our lives. And, and that's, that's been His heart during this time, in this last year or so. And it's a few weeks away, only three weeks time before Sunday mornings, we're gonna to begin to open up on Sundays in person and, and, and begin to be together in, in a bigger context than we've been able to for the last year or so. And I know we're all looking forward to that. And it's gonna take a month or two uh, to, to move into in-person meetings on Sundays in all the congregations and in, in the way that we are, we are used to. But let's not take our eyes off what God is doing in us and amongst us. And I believe God wants to say things to us this morning from Luke chapter 5. And and if you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to to grab your Bible and turn from here. Yes, the Scriptures are going to come on the screen, but just grab your Bible and uh, turn to Luke chapter 5. He 
Expect God to work in your heart this morning. Expect God to do things in you today. I had a weird dream last night. I don't normally have dreams and I haven't even mentioned this to Jane uh, this morning. <clears throat> it, wasn't a, it wasn't a nice dream. And I won't explain the whole thing, but basically <clears throat> Jane and I were somewhere, I don't know where, in what building it was, but she was, she was in a bathroom and suddenly she shouted out to me. She's like, Clive, uh, you know, you know, or, and I'm like, man, she sounds stressed, in distress. And, and I went into this bathroom and she was in there and, and, and I said, what's up? And as she looked at me, she looked over her shoulder and she said that. And at that moment, as I, as I looked across her shoulder, this, I don't know what, how you want to describe it, this demonic presence just wanted to overpower, overcome both of us in that moment. And it was like this thing was trying to squeeze and throttle me in the throat. And immediately what started to rise up within me was in the name of Jesus, get out. And when I first tried to say that, this thing was trying to squeeze the, the, the breath out of me. And it, it, it felt like I could hardly get this, the words out and, and this, this oppressive thing that was, was going on. And, and and I just, a few times, and then it basically got stronger to the point where in the dream, it, it, it felt like I shouted out at that moment and something broke. And at that moment I woke up and sat up in bed and I was like, wow, Jane must have heard me shout that. She must have done thinking I've, I've woken her up. And, I, and um, I know in the middle of the night, it's dark, isn't it? And I thought, well, she hasn't woken up. And, but yet, something broke, something was, was released at that moment, something was dealt with at that moment. And, <clears throat> and I sat there for a few moments and it, it was, you know, when you've had an experience like that, you, you can be sitting there a bit like, whoa, you know, uh, what's going on? And as I was sitting there in the dark, you know, in, pretty much in the dark, just praying, like, God, what was going on there? And, and I believe God just said to me, it's like the enemy is wanting, to over, is wanting to overtake or overpower the voice of my people. The enemy wants to throttle the voice of my people. He wants to try and disempower the voice and the name that I've placed in my people, in the church, in my body, in my bride. And He wants you to be looking over your shoulder. He wants you to be in a place of fear. He wants you to be in a place where you're not, you don't want to act because, and, and, and the enemy wants to overpower. And in the name of Jesus, right now, you and I as believers, we as the church, we will not be overpowered by the voice of the enemy or by the, a so-called power of the enemy or by the agendas of the enemy. As the people of God, as the church of Jesus Christ, we will not be overpowered by the enemy or the agendas that the enemy seeks to work out through people and through scenarios. And I want us to agree together right now as the church, as the ecclesia, I love the fact that the young people are looking at the Ecclesia, what that means over the next few weeks. And one of the aspects of the Ecclesia is, is it doesn't just translate as, as simply an English church, a, a, a people called out who just are gathered, you know, we're not 
uh, of the world uh, anymore, but we're still in it. We're not, it doesn't just mean that. Ecclesia means a people who rule and reign, a people who take dominion, a people who make decisions with authority that brings change. That's part of what the word Ecclesia means. And I want us to agree together right now. And, and what we're doing as we agree together is not just about our own lives in this moment that we're agreeing. We're agreeing together over our nation. We're agreeing together over our towns right now. The, the, the voice of God, the authority of His Word, that the people of God who carry His name and carry His Word and declare who He is and declare His gospel, the truth of who He is, the people of God will not be silenced. The people of God will not be over powered. The people of God will not have the air, their air blocks, their spiritual air blocks, if you like, or even the natural ones to be able to then speak, overpowered and silenced by the enemy. And I want us to agree right now, together as a church, across all our congregations, I want us to agree right now, we will not be silenced but the enemy's voice will be throttled, will be silenced, that he will be overcome. His agendas will come to nothing. They will not succeed. They will not come into fruition. Why? Because there is another God and it's called the living God, Jesus Christ, who has a people who are ambassadors, who represent Him on earth to speak in His name, to act in His name, to live in the way that He's called us to live. A people that live boldly and confidently, not in our own strengths and efforts and abilities, but a people who know their God and do mighty exploits. A people who know who they are in Christ and know that everything we have comes from Him. Therefore, we stand and live boldly because of who He is. So let's agree together right now as believers, as a church. Father, we thank You that You have joined us together, one heart, one mind as Your church, as Your people. And we stand right now in the Spirit together to say no to the voice of the enemy, no to the attempts of the enemy to try and overpower, to try and silence who we are or the church in this nation. We are agree right now as the people of God and we take authority over every lie of the enemy, over every agenda of the enemy where he seeks to try and silence the church and put the church in a corner. So you cannot do this any longer. You cannot do that anymore. We take authority over that and we tear that down right now. And we silence the voice of the enemy. We render those things powerless right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just pray right now for a fresh confidence and boldness in the church, in your people. To be a people of faith working through love. A people of authority because we're a people of humility. A people of power because we're a people of obedience surrendered, submitted to you. Father, I thank you for a fresh release of your spirit in our own church, in the churches, in the towns where we have congregations, in this 25 mile radius and beyond. Father, we thank you for a fresh release of your spirit in these days to accomplish all that you are wanting to do in this nation, Father, so that once again in this nation, like that was declared yesterday in the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, the scriptures that were declared about Jesus Christ being the Son of the living God, be it that Jesus Christ is God, the declarations that went over our nation yesterday, that there is only one God and His name is Jesus Christ. We thank You for the Scriptures that were, were, that were read and declared yesterday over our nation reminding us who, once again and reminding uh, the enemy once again who this nation belongs to, that this nation is a blood washed nation, that Jesus went to the cross for this nation, for our nation, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Jesus shed His blood for every person who lives on every street, in every household, in every town and city, every region in our nation.
And so, Father, we thank you right now for your Lordship in this nation, across the aisles of this nation. That you are Lord, that you are the Christ, the anointed one, the living God, the Saviour, the way, the truth and the life. And there is no other way to the Father except through you, through Him. We declare that over our nation. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We're the, we're the church of Jesus Christ. We're the ecclesia. We stand up in the authority that He's given us as believers, individually in our lives so that we live in victory and, and there's a lordship in our minds, in our hearts, our emotions, in our own lives. But also we stand together as the people of God, as the ecclesia for our nation, for our towns and cities and say, hey, enough's enough. We are not going to shrink back. We are not going to be silenced. This is who the living God is and this nation belongs to Him. And in our hearts we cry, Father, have mercy upon us as a nation. Have mercy on who we are as a nation. Father, don't treat us as we deserve when we turn our backs on you as a nation. But we thank you that you hold your, your hand of mercy out over our nation, giving us time to respond to you, giving the church time to be, to, to be cleansed and purified during this time. So that this, this bride comes out of this time of, of, of being in secret, coming out more as it were, that we come out with a greater authority and power and release of your spirit in these days and months to come. I thank you, Father, this nation's going to wake up to the true and living God. Father, I thank you for this prophetic release this morning as we agree together as Kingdom Faith Church. The truth is the truth. And Jesus Christ is that truth. God's Word, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is the truth of God's Word. His Word describes who He is, the living God, the eternal one, the mighty one, the everlasting one, <clears throat> the one that never changes. <clears throat> He's the same yesterday, today and forever. That there's nothing man can do on earth to try and legislate or do anything that will change who God is, that will change what His Word says. And so, Father, we thank You that we serve You, the living God. And Father, we pray for a, a humility in the church. How can we pray for a humility in our nation without first getting on our own knees in our own hearts and lives and humbling ourselves before you? So that we, are, we are as a church are a humble church. And where the church is humble, there's a humility, a brokenness even. And when we use the word brokenness, we don't mean that we're just, we don't mean being broken people in the sense of that we've got loads of problems in our lives in that sense. Because God heals the brokenhearted. God heals where there is brokenness because of life's traumas and, and incidents and everything else. God heals. But there's another kind of brokenness in the Bible. And that brokenness is where we live broken before God in the sense of there's a humility, there's a contrite heart, there's submission, where there's the, the, any pride in our lives has been broken, that we don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought, that we, we, we go to our knees first saying, Father, I need you. I don't want to live without you. There's a brokenness in our lives where we've, we're seeing who God is and we see who He is and say, God, I'm not worthy, even though He's made us worthy. So that, that brokenness doesn't turn into a, I'm not worthy of God any longer because He's made us worthy. But you live with this sense of awe saying, wow, God, I'm just not worthy of who You are, but yet You've made me worthy. What does that mean? It makes you full of thanksgiving 
knowing that you couldn't have done all any of this by yourself. And God wants us as a church to live in brokenness in that sense before God, a humility, submission, dependence, availability, obedience, response, responsiveness. So I want to encourage you, I'm sure he has been doing a heart work in, in you as he has me and I know my wife Jane and others of you, I know he's been doing stuff because conversations we've had with people and God is doing something deep, deep, deep at this time. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and lives at this moment. Thank you, Jesus. In Luke chapter 5, at the beginning, it talks about Jesus standing on the edge of Lake, the Sea of Galilee, Lake, as it puts in here, Gennesaret. And it says, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. Don't you love that picture? Picture that. Some of you have been to the Sea of Galilee, up into the Capernaum, sort of north part of the Galilee area of the Sea of Galilee. Maybe just picture a lake, Jesus standing on the edge of it and loads of people crowding around. <clears throat> and they're crowding around because they want to hear the Word of God. I believe that's a prophetic picture, if you like, of what we're going to see take place in these coming months and years the people crowding to come and hear or crowding around who Jesus is, not just coming here on a Sunday, if you understand what I'm saying. This is not about Sunday meetings. People wanting to crowd around Jesus, wanting to press into Jesus because they want to hear what He's saying. They want to hear His Word because when He speaks, it's different than when anybody else speaks. There's a sound that comes from His voice, the words that come from His lips. And when He speaks, it sounds like no one else. And people were crowding in around because it was like, man, when this guy speaks, something happens. When, when He speaks, something happens in me. When He speaks, things happen all around and, and, and the crowds were pressing in and we're coming into those days. <laughs> you might say, well, it doesn't look like it in the natural. It looks like things are going the opposite way. The more opposite they go to the Kingdom of God, the more we see the Kingdom of God at work. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. He sat down and began to teach the people from the boat. Another view of the crowd, if we can put it this way, is before COVID. Everybody, Christians, going to church and going to hear the Word, crowding around the Word, wanting to hear what God's saying. And during this time, God's been doing something deep in our hearts and lives. And in this story, what He does, He gets into the boat and He comes out from the shore and then He begins to teach the people. Their perspective begins to change. 
Instead of crowding around Him on the shore, they're now looking across the water. And Jesus has changed positions. He's moved from where He was into a new position. And they're looking at Him and they're listening to Him now with a different view, different scene behind Him. Then in that moment, when He finishes teaching, He says to Simon in verse 4, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. It's interesting, it says master there. And, and, be, and we can easily think that he was already one of Jesus' disciples because he called him master. He wasn't following Jesus yet at that point. He was still fishing, still doing whatever he was doing with his life. But he'd obviously heard a bit about Jesus. He may have heard some teaching then while he was doing his nets, he could hear this guy, this rabbi, somebody who'd be going, hey, have you heard about this Jesus? And he'd heard enough to call him master or teacher or rabbi, but he called him master. We've worked hard enough, but because you've said so, we're going to do it. And, and there was enough going on in his heart and his life at that moment to respond to, even though he didn't understand fully what was going on, he was like, yeah, but we've done all of that. Then in verse six, when they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And I believe Jesus wanted to, there's a few things I believe He wanted to do in this moment. Having been teaching the crowds and they're gathering around Him, wanted to hear what He was saying. He then changed His position to give them a different perspective. Then He did something that they weren't expecting, whether it is Simon the fisherman or the crowd. And in, in one sense, Jesus was now living out a parable that it was, He was going to explain in one sentence at the end of what was about to take place. This huge catch of fish. Simon's boat couldn't contain the scale of the catch and they cried out to their, called out to their partners to bring the other boat and, and both boats began to sink under the weight of the fish. What was Simon's response in that moment? It says he fell in verse eight. When Pe Simon Peter saw this, saw everything that took place, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Jesus changed everybody's perspective at that moment. He did something that none of them had ever seen before. For Simon Peter in that moment, a deep conviction came over him. He cried out to Jesus. He says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve you. I'm undeserving. Something happened in that moment. But what was Jesus' response? In verse 10, He says to Simon, don't be afraid from now on you will fish for people. It's like Jesus created all this scenario in front of them that was like a parable. He could have told a story to everybody. Hey, one day there was a fisherman and he put his boat out into the deep and he was told to put his nets on the other side. And when he did, he caught all these fish. And, and his response was that he then bowed down and and he could have told a story like that, but instead he's like, no, I'm not going to tell a story. I'm going to unfold and show, begin to show who I am and what I want to do with people's lives. And what he was saying to the crowd as well as Simon was, hey guys, this isn't just about hearing the Word and being fed. 
This is about following me. Because what was the response with Simon Peter, his brother John and James and, and, and uh, his, the partners in his business? It says at that moment they left everything and followed Jesus. I believe part of this time over the last year, 14 months, 15 months that God has been doing, I believe He's been working in our hearts, in the church, not just our own, but the church, and basically doing a deep work in us. And as we come out of this whole COVID thing, God has been working in His people, His church, to have a church that's going to follow Him. It means to follow Him that you leave some things behind. Simon Peter fell on his knees before Jesus and said, I'm a sinful man, I don't deserve you, go away from me. The thing that God does in our lives is He separates out the sin and deals with the negative, the stuff that can't go with us on the journey to follow Him. And there's some things we need to leave behind and make sure are left behind in our lives in order to go forward in this new season. I'm going to read a few lyrics from a song that encapsulate this so well. The heart of the Father for you and I his people. Because it's like there's a deep work that God has been doing, is doing, and is going to continue to do. It's a liberating work that He does in our hearts and lives because when He deals with the negative, it enables us to live in the positive of who He is and all that He's done for us. But Jesus came to reveal who the Father is. He says, I've not come with my own words, but the words I speak are the ones that the Father gives me. I've not come to do my own actions or my own thing. I've come to, I only do what I see the Father, or only what, he, what I see the Father doing. They're the things that I do. And Jesus' heart was to reveal the Father. But Jesus also came to reveal the kingdom. Two key things. To show the way to the Father and to talk about the kingdom and show what the kingdom was like. And as this parable was unfolding, Jesus was showing what the kingdom is like. It's one of abundance. It's one of salvation. It's one as Simon, Simon Peter fell on his knees and saying, get away from me. Jesus didn't reject him in that moment. Instead, he picked him up and said, hey, Peter, instead of living the way you have lived, I've got a new life for you and, and I'm now going to give you a purpose to live in a new way. And so you're not going to get caught up in, in saying I'm a sinful man any longer and I, I, you get away from me, Lord, and all that. Instead, your response is going to be, God, I want to go where you are. Jesus, I want to walk with you. I want to follow you because of who you are and what you've done. And Jesus picks him up and says, come, follow me. From now on, you're going to fish for men. I've got a purpose for you. I've got something for you to live for now. And over these coming weeks, we're going to be looking at things that Jesus said. What did he say about the kingdom? What did he say about the Father? But whenever Jesus said something, he was already living out what he was saying. And so as we look at what did Jesus say, Jesus said this, Jesus said that about the Father, about the kingdom, about what that means in terms of relationship with the Father, about what that looks like how, in how we live our lives, what it looks like in terms of how we witness to those that don't know Jesus. What does it look like to follow Jesus? 
Some of that will include, like the young people are looking at, what does it mean to be the ecclesia? What did Jesus say about that? What does it mean to be the people that God has called us to be? What does it look like to follow Jesus? And I want to read some words from this song that are so powerful in terms of God's heart for you and I. The song is called The Father's House. And the first line says, Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. The next line, what looks to me like weakness is then a canvas for your strength. And my story is not over. My story has just begun. Failure will not define me because that's what my father does. My father defines me, not failure, but the father, my father defines me. Simon's, Peter's response was, get away from me, I'm a failure, I'm nothing. But yet Jesus, in that response, picked him up and said, come on, you're a great candidate to follow me. Come on, you're a brilliant candidate to now come and fish for men. I've just shown you what I can do. Following me is going to be different. Following me is going to be like, whoa, this is what's going to happen. Then the chorus He says, lay your burdens down here in the Father's house. Check your shame. Leave your shame at the door because it ain't welcome anymore. Why? Because you're in the Father's house. And in this context, this is another verse. In the Father's house, in relationship with the Father, as we walk with Jesus, listen to this, prodigals come home, the helpless find hope, love is on the move when the Father is in the room. Where, what does that mean? Your life, my life, this is the room that the Father lives in by His Spirit when the Father's in the room, when the Father is in the room. It's not just when the Father is present somewhere in a building, in a home. It's when the Father is in the room. It says here, prodigals come home, the helpless find hope, love is on the move. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life when the Father is in the move, on the move. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds are shaken. Love breaks through when the Father is in the room. What was Jesus doing in that story? He was showing the love of the Father in that moment. Simon Peter says, I don't deserve you. Yet Jesus says, come on, follow me. You're going to now fish for men. And on this journey, I'm going to show you who the Father is. I'm going to show you what the kingdom's like, what you're part of, what you can live in the good of, how you can inherit the kingdom. I'm going to show you what it means to follow me. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be different. Some of it, you're going to get persecuted for what you believe. Because Jesus said to them at one stage, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Your life is a room. It's actually the Bible talks about us being temples of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling place for God, living stones. He comes to live in, we come alive in Him. And when God's in your life, it's like you become like an engine room. Your life becomes like an engine room of God. And what's God been doing in this time? Intimacy with Him. 
a dwelling place, abiding, remaining. He's been working, moving. He's been convicting of stuff that's not right. He's been dealing with us, but yet at the same time, he's been encouraging us, building us up many different ways. What's he been doing? Fine tuning this engine on the inside, this engine room that contains his life, his presence, his word, his power, his authority, his goodness, his love, his grace, his mercy. All of that is within us because he is within us. He's in us when we know him in that way. And God wants to release this energema, this God energy, this God power, this word energema, that's what it means. God energy, God power. He wants that not just to be at work in us, but to be released through us. We've heard some stories recently of just through words of knowledge, people getting healed, you know, sitting in their homes, in different ways over the last few weeks. That's just the first fruits, bits and pieces, if you like, of what God's doing. It's amazing because He's life transforming what happens in those moments. But the same God who gives a word of knowledge and heals somebody sitting on their couch is the same God that is in you, that when you speak and you bring something from God to someone else, then there's a release of God to do whatever it needs in somebody's life, whether it is somebody gets healed or there's a breakthrough or release or whatever takes place. You have the same Holy Spirit. You have the same word in you because you're an engine room of God. You have His life and His power, His authority in you. You. And as we humble ourselves, like Simon Peter did in that moment, he, he fell at Jesus' knees. As we humble ourselves like that, day by day before God, say, God, I don't want to live today in my own effort, power, strength, ability, skills, gifts, understanding, wisdom, or anything. As we submit all of that, say, God, I want to live in your life, power, wisdom, authority, gifting, whatever that means. We want to live available. Let's just take a few moments to pray together. Maybe there's some things you need to leave at the door of your life this morning. Only you know what they are things you need to leave at the door. It could be shame. You know, when you ask God to forgive you, boom, He forgives you right away. Wipes the slate clean. And the power of shame that tries to, I give you an identity that says, you're never going to be good enough for God because of this, that and the other. That's a lie from the enemy. Shame doesn't define you. It's your Father who defines who you are. And as, I don't know, maybe you want to get on your knees this morning in your home. Maybe you don't normally do that, I don't know. Maybe you want to get on your knees this morning for a few minutes and just humble yourself before God and just kneel before Him and, and just say, Father, I come to you afresh today. I surrender to you afresh this morning. I bow my heart and my life to you in a fresh way. I surrender, submit to you. There's some things I want to leave behind. There's some things I want to let go of. They could be shame. There could be guilt for something. There could be this, that and the other. And it's like, God, I give you this right now. I should have forgive me for whatever it is. If you've asked God to forgive you for think the same thing in the past, you are already forgiven. He forgave you the first moment you turned to Him and say, God, forgive me. I repent of that. 
I, I, and whatever. As soon as you said that, it could have been yesterday, weeks ago, boom, you were forgiven because that's how he works. God doesn't linger with his forgiveness. He comes right away and forgives like Simon Peter. He says, I'm not worthy. Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. But yet Jesus in that moment, he saw his repentant heart and he says, hey, Peter, come on, I've got a mission for you. I've got a purpose for you. Come on, follow me and you're going you're gonna to now fish for men. You're going to start seeing some different things happen through your life from today onwards. Maybe you just need to submit afresh just in your life in general, your decision making, some decisions you've got ahead of you. Maybe you need to submit your finances to the Lord. Some decisions you're going to make about finance. Maybe you just need to submit afresh and say, Father, I want to bring this scenario, these situations, these decisions under your Lordship. It's your money at the end of the day, not mine. You, I belong to you. Everything I have is yours. So I don't want to use or spend this money or whatever I'm thinking of doing with it in whatever way, unless this is what you want. It could be a time. Times making space. It could be your work, work, business, whatever it is. Father, I just submit, I humble myself and I bring my work to you, my business. Bring it under your Lordship in a fresh way. Father, I want you to lead this business. I want you to be Lord in my workplace. It might be something going on in your body right now, physical thing or whatever. Again, it's just, Father, I get before you now. I thank you for your healing power being released in my body. It's simply so that we can follow Him. Unhindered, unfettered, unashamed, Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're working in every one of our lives at this moment as we respond to you. Some of you watching this morning, you might not know Jesus. You might have never responded to him or heard about him or, or whatever you might have been watching this morning, maybe for the first time, if you have, welcome. Great to, well, I know you can see me, I can't see you. Great to have you with us this morning. Maybe you've been watching over for a while now and you've been checking things out, asking questions and maybe you know that, that because of what's going on in you, this inquisitiveness, it's like God's working in your heart and your life and you know he is, but you haven't surrendered your life to him yet. And maybe this morning is that moment where you, because you know God's been working in your heart, you know th some things have been happening and you know He's been drawing you. He's been kind of showing you who He is and, and you've been asking questions and you've been checking some things out. And, and maybe this morning is that moment where you say, Jesus, I, I, I want to surrender everything to you. I want to give you my life. I want to be like Simon Peter. On one level, I, I kind of understand I don't deserve God from what I've had. And, and maybe some of you who don't know Jesus who are watching this morning, you're connecting in today. Maybe you are sitting there saying, well, I, I've done stuff and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not worthy of God. I'm not good enough. And how could God accept me? That's that. God loves it when we come to Him and say, God, I don't deserve you. I've done stuff that whatever. And... and, and one of the best things that God loves to do is forgive. Clean us up, sort us out, take away the pain, deal with the guilt and shame. That's one of the things that God loves to do. Why? Because He is a good Father. He's never failed anybody and He will never fail because the Bible says He never fails. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He is faithful. 
And this morning, maybe you don't know Jesus and you want to respond to him and say, I want to give my life to you to Jesus. Simply, I, I don't know, maybe I'd encourage you, maybe get on your knees. And I don't know if you're on your own, you could be with others. You think, wow, this is a bit radical, get on my knees. But this is a life changing decision at this moment. Jesus wants people who are going to follow him. And maybe you're just on your knees or you're just bowing your head or I don't know, as a, as a point of father, just talk to him for a moment. Say, God, I come to you. I need your forgiveness. I need your freedom. I need your healing. I need you. And maybe just ask him right now, God, forgive me. Would you cleanse my heart and my life of sin, guilt, shame, pain, all the stuff of life that's happened. Forgive me for being self-centered, for going after my own things all the time. And God, I surrender my life to you right now. Thank you that you forgive me, you cleanse me. And I give you my life right now, but I ask you to give me yours. I want you to come and live in me. Like that guy was saying, I want to have this, I want to be like an engine room. I want to have you in my life. I don't understand everything this guy is saying this morning, but what I do know in my heart is I've got to give my life to you. Father, I just pray for every person responding like that this morning, that you would move in their heart and life right now, that they would know there's a change happening in their heart and life at this moment. I thank you, Jesus, for your Lordship coming in, your saving grace coming in right now. I thank you, Jesus, that you're changing lives and hearts right now. I thank you, Jesus. And Father, I thank you for that release in the whole body of your spirit in a fresh way to do only what you can do in and through us. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We got an encounter night Wednesday night. I want to encourage you, be part of that encounter night. God wants to continue on as we worship and, and just flow together, pray prophetic stuff as he ministers and moves and whatever he wants to do. Let's join together 8 p.m. Wednesday evening online. We're going to have an encounter. It's going to be powerful time and, and just come ready for what God wants to do in our hearts. Let's allow him to continue to go deeper in us. Sometimes we go, oh, what, you know, more of that. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because we want to know Him. And as we know Him like that, there's a great release of Him through our lives. We thank You, Lord. Father, we praise Your name. As part of this new season uh, in May, we've obviously got the whole Soul Winner training with Pastor Andy Elms coming up and want to encourage you to sign up for that. Jane and I have signed up. I know a bunch of people have already, but let's have a quick look at this video just to remind us of what's happening through May. And then uh, Kevin's going to come and just let us know how we can sign up. So bless you guys. Have an amazing Sunday, a brilliant week, and we'll see you Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Let's encounter God together. Hi, everyone. Got an exciting new initiative for you. It's called Soul Winner Bootcamp. A little while ago, I wrote a book called Soul Winner. The purpose of the book was to train and equip people how to win their friends and family to the Lord. Now, we've developed this course that's going to accompany the book called The Soul Winner Bootcamp. It runs for five weeks, one night a week over a five-week period. And in those five weeks, we develop a learning community filled with questions and answers and real practical teaching on how to be an effective soul winner. I want to encourage you, I want to invite you to come and join me on one of these Soul Winner Boot Camps and let me train you and equip you to be effective in the harvest field for God. You will love it. You will grow, you will be encouraged and you will be inspired to lead others to Christ. See you soon on the next Soul Winner Boot Camp.
the Soul Winner Bootcamp. I am hyped for this. Sharon and I have already registered and uh, if you've read the book, you know it's filled with advice, tips, and just uh, fully equips you to be a great witness for the Lord. And so I know that the boot camp is going to do just that and more. God really wants to do something special in us through that boot camp and through those five weeks. So you might have heard us and just Pastor Clive now as well talk about it over the last few weeks and maybe you haven't signed up yet and I want to really encourage you to take the time today and sign up and make the space in your agenda for that. God left us with one mission, right? To let the world know, to make disciples. And I don't know about you, but I want to do well at that mission and I'll take any equipping I can to help me in that. So you can sign up on the website, soulwinner.co.uk forward slash training. Uh, and it starts on the 5th of May. As well, Pastor Kai, I've mentioned it on Wednesday, we're having the encounter night at 8 p.m. So that's gonna be a brilliant time to hear from God. And what a message we heard from God this morning. Just, I loved how uh, Pastor Kai shared about the switching of position of Jesus and how it changed people's perspective, the crowd and Simon's perspective. And then he did something unexpected and we had that beautiful response from Simon. Hey, let us know in the chat, what was one thing that stood out for you this morning from the message? It might be one word, it might be one sentence, it might be something God did in you. Just let us know in the chat uh, on the website. This morning, you're able to give your tithes and offerings. There's a tab next to the chat on the website. If you're on YouTube, go on Kingdom Faith's website and you'll find it there. There's also gonna be a link that pops in. So you can just click on that and do all of your giving right there. Last but not least, we have in the Hub Online as we do every week. It's time to let everyone know everything that God has done this morning in your life, everything that he's done over the week. You can chat and share, not talk about Spurs, um, but let's just uh, do that. All the links are gonna appear in the chat and have a great time. Guys, it's been a blast to be together. Uh, we love you and appreciate you. Have a great week. See you next time. Bye-bye.